Welcome to No Compromise, where faith and reason fuse in conversation. Qu'ils sont pour les pieds. Hello, Johnny. Hello, my love. Hello, everyone. So another week, another C.S. Lewis essay, huh? Yep, here we go. So not too much news going on here. We're still trying to assemble that ebook. Right. And that's probably because I'm dragging my feet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that happened was that we had to take down all our C.S. Lewis content from YouTube, huh? Yes. We've had a strike apparently from Harper Collins objecting if, to our content. If Harper Collins. If Harper Collins uses a Gmail account. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's somebody with a Gmail account. Yeah, it seems a little doubtful. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, we took it down to be safe. Yeah. So this week we're going to discuss the funeral of the great myth. Right. And it's a bit frustrating because you can't go to YouTube to listen to right. it now. Right. It is still up on our podcast, mm -hmm. but we're wondering whether or not we shouldn't attach some sort of Warning label Disclaimer. to it. Disclaimer, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so far we talked about the seeing eye. Right, first we, one. We talked about the poison of subjectivism. That was last, last week. Last week, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the third essay, and it's called The Funeral of the Great Myth. Right. As you said, you can listen to it on the podcast. We put a link in the description. So, Okay, so let's talk about the background of this essay. Okay. The author is? C.S. Lewis. Right. And it was about 1945-ish? Somewhere in that time period, I think, yes. So in This the, one is less definite. I haven't been able to actually yeah, find the, the exact date. And world happenings? Well, it's the end of World War II, and so the middle of the 20th century. Communism is certainly rife in the world, having mm -hmm. just taken over the Soviet Union. And Lewis actually references that right. in this essay. We probably won't talk about it, but he does reference it. And how about in Lewis's own personal circle? What was going on? Right. So Lewis, being a professor in Oxford, mm -hmm. is ensconced in the academic world and uh, has a certain view of things that's based on that rather limited viewpoint mm -hmm. because academia really is its own world, it tends right. to be way ahead of the rest of the world, kind of predictive in a way of where things are going. Right. Um, the the old statement, as go the universities, so goes the culture, is a truism. Right. And Lewis actually, I think, gets it wrong in this essay. I was going to say, he talks about the funeral, and you say it's not a funeral. Right. In fact, what it may have been was maybe for a brief time in the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. this great myth that he talks about had a head cold, and it looked like it was going to die. Right. But right. in fact, it recovered uh, full strength and uh, is now roaring like a lion. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, let's begin our discussion. Can you give us a brief description of the essay? Right. So it's called The Funeral of a Great Myth. Wow. And Lewis makes the point early on that this is the great myth of the 19th century and early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Of course, writing in the middle of the 20th century, he had a pretty good backwards look on what it was. Yeah. But to pronounce its death at the time of Lewis's writing of this essay was definitely premature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he calls the myth the myth of evolution. Right. This is the great myth that Lewis is talking about. Right. And what he means by that yeah. is not the scientific doctrine of evolution, which we trace back to the 1859 Origin of Species yeah, by the, Charles Darwin. The biological evolution. Right, so biological evolution. Now he's L talking about popular. Right, Lewis is talking about evolution as it is popularly conceived. Mm -hmm. And this idea was actually well in advance right. of the scientific theory. And we talked about that before. Right. And this is, from my perspective, mm -hmm. Hegel. Right, exactly. And Lewis never actually says that in this essay. Yeah. But our Christian atheist this Monday was called The Funeral of a Great Myth or Evolution and Hegelian Optimism. Right. And we cover what Hegelian optimism is quite extensively in the Hegel series. Yeah. So, so John, why do you think he calls it a myth rather than just saying it's Hegelianism? Lewis, for some reason, didn't connect a lot of these ideas mm -hmm. to Hegel in the way that I do. Yeah. And that's probably because he was not 
intimately familiar. Not like you. Not I like mean, you I did, was. You did your dissertation on Hegel. <laughs> right. And so my graduate work actually familiarized me with okay. Hegel at a level that very few people get to understand. Say, you often said before that Hegel is not studied. Right. And not yeah. understood right. by those who study him for the most part. Right. Okay, so basically, Lewis points to Hegel without mentioning Hegel. Right. So what is the myth exactly What is so, that he's talking about? The myth of evolution, as Lewis explains it to us, is the idea that everything is getting better. Mm -hmm. And this is a myth because it's not what the actual science says. Right. Things don't, without some sort of rational intervention, get better by yeah. themselves. Things tend to, according to the second law of thermodynamics, right. which I think you mentioned before, wear down. things tend to wear down, not to improve. Right. And so order and structure, when we see them in the universe, seem to be the result of some sort of pre-existing order and structure yeah. that is instantiating reality. And the idea that Things are all by themselves getting better, mm -hmm. getting more complex, getting more rational, mm -hmm. is, in terms of the science, kind of ridiculous. Poppycock. Yes, poppycock. <laughs> but it's <laughs> not in the popular mind. No. And I think this is unarguable. Most people, when they consider evolution, they associate that word with progress. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to associate it with right, progress, right. because as many things fall apart as get better. And in fact, there are far more instances of things falling apart than things getting better. Mm -hmm. So while there may have been instances of evolution, things getting more complex as they evolved, that is not what Lewis is talking about. That is a possibility for biological evolution, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work in terms yeah. of things by themselves getting better. Things tend to fall apart. That is what science teaches us. Getting back to the essay, what does Lewis say the central idea of the myth is? The central idea of the myth is what its believers would call evolution, or development, or emergence. And then Lewis makes a qualification that I think is very important. Uh -huh. I do not mean that the doctrine of evolution as held by practicing biologists is a myth. It may be shown by later biologists to be a less than satisfactory hypothesis than was hoped 50 years ago, but that does not amount to it being a myth. It is a genuine scientific hypothesis. But we must sharply distinguish between evolution as a biological theorem and popular evolutionism or developmentalism, which is certainly a myth. Mm -hmm. So he's pronouncing the death of evolution, but he's not talking about biological evolution. He's talking right. about a process metaphysics. Right. And, and that's okay. a good okay, way to wait. think of it. Could you real quick tell us what is process metaphysics? So a process metaphysics is the idea that everything is in flux. Yeah. Right. In many ways, and this is a point I've tried to make in other places in the Christian Atheist. Yeah, in the Hegel series. And elsewhere mm -hmm. too, that this idea of Hegel, process metaphysics, mm -hmm laid the groundwork for much real science. That is, there's something really valid going on here. So science picked up on this idea and discovered that it has some real validity. Good. And one of the ways in which I think it is valid, and it laid the foundation for Einstein's E equals MC squared, yeah, the idea that energy and matter are convertible. Right, mm -hmm. that all of the material world we see around us is really reified energy. And that is a process metaphysics. Okay. Essentially, then, the idea of a metaphysics is that everything is flow, mm -hmm. everything is process, and everything is then developmental. Yeah. Okay. And that's the central idea behind it. Okay. So this would probably be a good time to listen to the Hegel series or maybe listen to our simpler version on No Compromise. Exactly. Where we try to make Hegel simpler. Right. There's no reason to go into to Hegel in depth here. We've done that yeah, elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Lewis does not talk specifically about Hegel. 
talks about things are getting better. And you call that Hegelian optimism. Right. In the series on Hegel, I call mm-hmm. that Hegelian optimism. Right. 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 The idea that things are always ascending, always mm-hmm. getting better. And this is the idea that reason is the process behind everything right. that Hegel talks about. Right. Darwin, you think that Darwin was affected by Hegel, right? I do. And I don't have any good historical reason that I can point to other than it was in the air. But in (laughs) in this essay, Lewis makes the point that before Darwin, the Hegelian idea of evolution was already in place, right? Exactly. And that struck me as well. He quotes Keats. A poem by Keats. Right. What was it? The the, the last four lines? Right. So you read those. In Keats's Hyperion, these four lines. Uh-huh. So on our heels a fresh perfection treads, a power more strong in beauty, mm-hmm. born of us, and fated to excel us as we pass in glory that old darkness. And so this was written by Keats in 1818 and 1819. Long before the origin of species. But then again, at the height of Hegel's career. Right. Right, And actually, 10 years after, Hegel published the Phenomenology of Spirit, in which these ideas, the idea of developmental creation, of evolution, were instantiated in the world clearly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so these ideas themselves, I think, were so deeply imbibed in the culture that Darwin himself would perhaps not even in an explicit way been able to trace it back. But it was part of the culture at the time, Mm -hmm. and it was able to influence his thinking in such a way that this enabled him to come up with this idea of evolution, biological evolution. And this was around 1818, 1819. That's when the poem was written. That's when the poem was written. But long before that even, Hegel's ideas Mm -hmm. were very much in development and actually already instantiated in publications Mm -hmm. and being taught in the universities. So this Keats poem, he was writing that things were getting better. Right. So the idea is that we ourselves Mm -hmm. are the product of what came before us, and we're better than that. But what's coming after us will be even better than us. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the notion of evolution, the popular notion of evolution. Mm-hmm. It flies in the face of, of the Christian notion that human beings are human beings for all time. Mm-hmm. We haven't really changed. No. We are exactly the same creatures we've always been. That's the idea there. But the popular idea of evolution is that things are constantly getting better and that therefore all we need to do is just let it happen yeah, yeah. or get out of the way or try to help it. And Lewis speaks of this myth manifesting it. I mean, you call the myth Hegelianism. He speaks of it manifesting itself in the arts. I mean, he talks about the early 19th century musician, right. Richard Wagner. He mentions a letter. A, a letter that Wagner wrote. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's it. important. Like I said, I found it in philosophy. Uh-huh. But Lewis traces it in his area of expertise. Which is... Literature. Right. Exactly. And so this letter from Richard Wagner is incredible in and, expressing the Hegelian notion that we're talking about and here. And Wagner was very influential in Lewis's life. In Lewis's life yeah. and in the 19th century and early 20th century, for sure. Wagner was huge. Real quick. I remember in Surprise by Joy, he talked a lot about Wagner. Yes. Do you remember he that? loved Wagner. Yeah. Okay. So read the letter that. Okay. Yeah, so this fragment of the letter that Wagner wrote about his Ring Cycle mm-hmm. opera series, mm-hmm. his Nibelungenlied. Mm-hmm. Easy his, for you to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the progress of the whole drama shows the necessity of recognizing and submitting to the change, the diversity, the multiplicity, the eternal novelty of the real. Yeah. Wotan rises to the tragic height of willing his own downfall. Right. Oh, man, is that (laughs) important. And continuing with the letter. This is all we have to learn from the history of man, to will the necessary and ourselves to bring it to pass. (laughs) That sounds so familiar, like the language of today's woke culture. You know it. It does. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. today's culture. 
and also like the philosophy of right by Hegel. Okay. Because Hegel makes it clear, and we've talked about this extensively, so I'm not going to beat it to death, but we've talked about it in the philosophy of right, how Hegel makes the point that the law is something that we must simply submit to, right? Mm -hmm. Spirit is free in itself, but we human beings are simply cogs in the machine. Yeah. And it is our position to simply align ourselves with the necessity of reality yeah. and submit to it. That is to will our own downfall, mm -hmm. right? And this is what the leftist ideology yeah. has been pushing for the last two centuries. The long march through the institutions mm -hmm. to tear down the West in order that something new better, and better yeah, something better's coming, will come right. as a result. So Lewis here shows it in culture right. with Wagner, but we're seeing it later in Marx, huh? Right. And this is Marx to the nth degree, uh -huh. for sure. Mm -hmm. Because Marx says, what was the favorite quote from Goethe's Faust? that he loved. It was, all that exists deserves to perish. perish. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. In order that, the, I mean, this is a part of the, the quote, but in order that that which is rational and good will come to pass, mm -hmm. will come into being. Okay. Then Lewis goes on to say about how science has been subverted, and you like what he says on this. I do. Lewis says this. This, then, is the first proof yeah. that popular evolution is a myth. In making it, the imagination runs ahead of scientific evidence, right? And this is what the point we've just made, that it wasn't until mm -hmm. 1859 yeah. that the science came out of evolution. And yet the popular myth of evolution that brought birth to the science was actually already in the world for a long time wow. previous to that. And then Lewis says this. If science has not met the imaginative need, science would not have been so popular. Mm -hmm. But probably every age gets within certain limits the science it desires. And you love that. I love that <laughs> because it tells that. the truth mm -hmm. about science. Yeah. Science is a human discipline, like yeah. all of the rest of the human disciplines, and is subject to all the failures right. that every other discipline is subject to. Right. And right. all the pressures of social reality. And you enjoy that too. I do, because, because we've lived for 50 years now, Yeah, you and I. And you listen to the stories on the news and you giggle <laughs> yeah. when you hear that science has been revised. Right. The science has been revised and overturned. <laughs> How many times have they rewritten the optimal dietary structures <laughs> under which we are supposed to live. Right, the four right? basic food groups, the so food pyramid. Coffee's good for you, <laughs> coffee's not good for you. Right. Right. Um, alcohol is good for you, alcohol is not good for you. Mm -hmm. And it's it changes on and on. all the time. Right. So we see that science is a human discipline right. like any other. It's subjected to our. Right. And subject. it is subject to being manipulated. Mm -hmm by human desires and human subjectivity and social pressures. And the, and the funny thing is Lewis is talking in 1945. 1945. <laughs> and today we are living through an era in which science, yeah. the objective science, has been subverted at a level that we've never seen before. Right, right, right. right? The idea that science is now embracing that there is no such concept as gender, that men and women are not something we can define. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is being accepted by science. Mm -hmm. They're actually putting out papers in scientific journals that support this hogwash. It's almost like a quasi-religious idea, don't you think? It is definitely yeah. a quasi-religious like, issue, just like we talked about last week, yeah. that this is an ideology. Yeah. Right, it's yeah. something that you buy into. Yeah, but it's, it's even in the face of the evidence, mm -hmm. almost like a magic is keeping things going. Or right, and I mean to the point where you have an apocalypse is coming because of the environmental sins that we've right. we've, we've heaped on ourselves. And, yes, and we're even to the point where we're sacrificing people to save the earth. Yeah, 
Yeah, this Humans. this nurturing mother myth that the earth is some sort of sweet and kind mother looking out for our best interests yeah. is not supported by the science yeah. Yeah. or the history of humanity. That is not the case. It is a simple lie, mm -hmm. and yet it is embraced by thinking, intelligent, college-educated yeah. people <laughs> because it's been pushed as the agenda mm -hmm. for years and years and years. And why? Because it's useful for yeah. them. Yeah. In order to well, it's Marx overturn. It is Marx. Okay. Yes, it um, really is Marx. Lewis says something really good at this point. In the myth, evolution, as the myth understands it, is the formula of all existence. Mm -hmm. To exist, in the myth's terms, that is. Yeah. To exist means to be moving from the status of almost zero to the status of almost infinity. To those brought up on the myth. And this is the educational system that Lewis is looking at. He's examined it in detail mm -hmm. in The Abolition of Man and talks about it to some extent in Mere Christianity yeah. as well and in other essays. This is the myth that all of us have been brought up on in our current culture. Mm -hmm. It has invaded yeah. our schools and our academic it's institutions. And everywhere. now everybody just assumes it's the truth mm -hmm. and it's reality. To those brought up on the myth, Lewis says, nothing seems more normal, more natural, more plausible than that chaos should turn into order, death into life, ignorance into knowledge. And with this, we reach the full-blown myth. Mm -hmm. It is. And this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. One of the most moving and satisfying world dramas which have ever been yeah. imagined. But just because it's emotionally satisfying oh, yeah. doesn't make it true, right? It, exactly right. But that doesn't make mm -hmm. it true. Mm -hmm. And this, for me, as an atheist, was something that I bought into and tried to support, but eventually fell apart mm -hmm. as I looked at it carefully. What about the creedal atheists? The creedal atheists in our world, uh -huh. the people that I call the creedal atheists, tend to actually be more on our side yeah. in yeah. this discussion. I mean, look at Dawkins. Right. Richard he Dawkins got has got in himself yeah. into deep, hot water with mm -hmm. the wokists because he says, wait a second, reality yeah. dictates to us what the constraints are. Mm -hmm. And we must respect what reality tells us. Right, right. And that's science. And so the vast majority of creedal atheists actually side with the Christians, right. with those who believe in a transcendent reality, more than they side with the other side. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yeah, thinking of Sam Harris. Sam Harris, in his own way, mm -hmm. is searching for the truth. Right. And he has a lot more in common with the Western tradition and even the Western theistic tradition yeah. than he has with yeah, the woke yeah. Hegelian doctrines that are pervading our culture right. today. So, so getting back to the essay, John, the myth has not died. No, the myth is not crazy, died. crazy, actually. It's going crazy. <laughs> yeah, the funeral oration was well in advance of the death. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, the myth has come back Full, full, full scale, full yeah, force, yeah, and so, is yeah overtaking our world. I mean, Lewis finds the myth compelling, right? Right. What does he say about it? Why it's so popular? Well, one of the reasons he talks about the myth being so popular is here. Another source of strength in the myth is what the psychologists would call its ambivalence. Mm -hmm. It gratifies equally two opposite tendencies of the mind: the tendency to denigration and the tendency to flattery. In the myth, everything is becoming everything else. In fact, everything is everything else at an earlier or later stage of development, which is just Hegel. Mm -hmm. That is Hegel's say, philosophy. Yeah, yeah, it sounds so much like Hegel. The later stages always being the better. Mm -hmm. This means that if you are feeling like Mencken, you can, quote, debunk all the respectable things by pointing out that they are merely elaborations of the disreputable things. 
Love is merely an elaboration of lust. Virtue, merely an elaboration of instinct, and so forth. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it also means that if you are feeling what the people call idealistic, you can regard all the nasty things in yourself or your party or your nation as being merely the undeveloped forms of all the nice things. Vice is only undeveloped virtue. Right. Egoism, only undeveloped altruism. A little more education will set everything right. Hmm. And while we were taking our walk today, I was going to ask you to, to talk about that. I uh -huh. said to you that one of the markers here that this is Hegelianism mm -hmm. is that we are told to believe, that is, this doctrine believes two fundamentally contradictory things right. at the same time. The woke will tell us that our subjective reality is the most real thing going. Right. That we can create the world around us, what Kant would have called empirical idealism. That we make our world. Yeah. So this empowers the subject almost to the point of being God. And yet, at the same time, it holds to the doctrine of determinism, which tells us that no person can be held responsible for any of their actions or deeds because they are simply products of the culture that produced them. Mm -hmm. So now you have... You have two contradictory notions right. Right. being held at the same time, and both of them given the same dignity of truth. Right. In wokeism and in what preceded wokeism, Marxism and critical theory. Right, right. This is all Hegel. And even if Lewis doesn't draw the point, mm -hmm. I do. And this is why I have drummed over and over <laughs> in the Christian atheist for the last three years, that we need to understand this Hegelian doctrine and how it has pervaded our thinking our actions and the culture in such a manner that even the church itself yes. has been undermined by the thinking of Hegelian optimism. Of Hegelian optimism, <laughs> right. And all of Hegelian thinking, right. the dialectic <laughs> itself, that we can maintain two fundamentally logically opposed <laughs> points at the same time is endemic to right. Hegelian thinking. Okay, so. So Lewis has come to the same conclusion as you. Yes. Except he calls it, he doesn't call it Hegelianism. He calls it a myth. Right. Right. Which is probably a lot simpler than you. Right. Hegel, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as but, always, actually, um, one of the things I've learned so mm -hmm. much from reading Lewis, and and you've taught me as well, is that simplifying things down to the understandable means you understand them better. Right. And so, I failed with that and a lot of the Christian atheists. And I'm trying to learn from Lewis's example how to express things so that people understand what it is I'm saying. Say it more plain. Yes. What, what was it? Say it more plain, <laughs> light, and easy, or something like that. Simple. <laughs> okay. So what do you think of the word he uses, the myth? You call it Hegelianism, but he calls it the myth. What do you think of that word? The myth. Well, myth is a good word mm -hmm. for what's going on for the Hegelian thing mm -hmm. because it is incredibly appealing. Yeah. Why not believe in a world in which our subjective desires and thoughts can become reality? How wonderful that would be. But it's a myth mm -hmm. because it doesn't correspond to reality. Chesterton calls Christianity a myth. Right. And that's true. Right. And Lewis himself said mm -hmm. that, that Christianity is probably best thought of as a myth yeah. that became reality. Yeah. Right. That the God man, Jesus Christ, became a human being and then died and rose again from the grave. Yeah. These were myths that were present in paganism. For years, for a long time, before the reality came to be. Right, right. And we might think of that as a prefiguring of reality itself. 
Okay, so let's move on to the end of the essay. Lewis basically says, I'm going to enjoy all of these myths, even if they're not true. Right. So we can actually end by mm -hmm. reading that section, the very end of the essay. This myth, Lewis says, gives us almost everything the imagination craves. Irony, heroism, vastness, unity in multiplicity, and a tragic close. It appeals to every part of me except my reason. That is why those of us who feel that the myth is already dead for us must not make the mistake of trying to debunk it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. We must not fancy that we are securing the modern world from something grim and dry, something that starves the soul. The contrary is the truth. And you know, when I have arguments, when I have discussions yeah. with atheists, I see this all the time. Yeah. They hold on to this with every fiber of their being. They and do. I understand that so well mm -hmm. because I did it you as did an it atheist. You did it for 25 years. That's right. Mm -hmm. I held on to these explanations that ultimately, rationally fell apart. Right, right. But it's hard to get you to see that point. And Lewis actually makes the point earlier in the essay that trying to get these people who are rational, intelligent people to see this is incredibly difficult. It is. And that they can't reveals how deep the disease has become. Right. And of course, the disease is just Hegelianism. Mm -hmm. It is just the Hegelian dialectic that allows us to believe two contradictory things at the same time, hiding one side from ourselves while we're believing the other, right. and then switching over and believing the one and hiding the other from ourself, right. which is what I say creedal atheism is constantly doing. Right. This notion of agnostic atheism mm -hmm. is precisely that, exactly. playing fast and loose with logic, holding on to one side while you deny the other, and then holding on to the opposite side while you deny the side that denies the side that you just accepted. <laughs> it is a huh. constant playing back and forth, yeah. something what I call an endemic to Hegelian thinking, a self-deceptive structure. Yeah. And you were thinking that way when you were an atheist? I was thinking that way as an atheist. Hmm. And I get myself in trouble with the atheists all the time as they tell me, that's not what we think. But the fundamental point that I'm trying to make yeah. is that you're deceiving yourself yeah. in what you think you think. And you <laughs> and you know because you- I was you, there. You were there, right. And then you turned and became a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> I did become, become a little a child boy. again. Right. And- in many ways, this is a paradox. Mm -hmm. And of course, I love paradox because in coming back to Christianity, yeah. I did return to childhood mm -hmm. in the sense that I can now look at the world as this beautiful marvel, this, mm -hmm. this magical thing that I don't understand. Right. And that I can seek to understand. That's the adventure mm -hmm. of Christianity. To seek to understand. It's the adventure of science. It's the adventure of life. To try to, as Einstein said, mm -hmm. grasp the thoughts of God. That is magical. And it is, in a sense, a remystification of the world. Mm -hmm. Again, Chesterton. Right. But the opposite side of that is the desire to explain everything, to feel as though Everything can be grasped and understood and explained by human reason. Right. And that is the position that I left as an atheist. Right. That I left behind. So picking up where we left off in the Lewis quote at the end of the essay. Mm -hmm. That is why those of us who feel that the myth is already dead for us must not make the mistake of trying to debunk it mm -hmm. in the wrong way. We must not fancy that we are securing the modern world from something grim and dry, something that starves the soul. The contrary is the truth. It is our painful duty to wake the world from an enchantment. The real universe is probably, in many respects, less poetical, certainly less tidy and unified than they had supposed. 
And that is the case, Mm -hmm. right? And this is why it is so paradoxical, because Christianity reduces and heightens Mm -hmm. the mystery. Mm -hmm. It makes us less important than the myth does, but also of eternal value to our Creator. The myth allows us to go from the status of merely nothing to God himself. Right. Whereas the reality says you are merely the creations of God, Mm -hmm. and you have a specific purpose to serve, and your delight, your reality, will be in serving that purpose. Right. So you are not God in reality, but you are God in the myth. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, Christianity reduces our status, and that's the humility that God demands of us, Mm -hmm. to recognize that we are not God, that we will never be God, and that our greatest delight will be in serving the higher value, not being the higher value. But, Lewis says, it was all, that is the myth, on a certain level, nonsense. But a man would be a dull dog if he could not feel the thrill and charm of it. For my own part, though I believe it no longer, I shall always enjoy it, as I enjoy other myths. I shall keep my caveman where I keep Balder and Helen and the Argonauts, and there often revisit him. And so the mythology may be exciting, it may be thrilling, it may make us feel more empowered and of greater worth to ourselves, Mm -hmm. but all of those feelings don't make it true. No. Okay, so I guess that should be it for this week, huh? Right. We'll call call it a day. Yeah. Don't forget, everyone, to check out the links in the description for the different things that we've talked about. Right. And links to the essay we read without commentary, links to the Christian Atheist episode earlier this week. Mm -hmm. So, Johnny, what's on the Christian Atheist schedule for next week? The next essay will be Historicism. Mm -hmm. Do you have have an alternate name yet? I haven't haven't developed yet. We'll have to, we're in the process of studying it now, and Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come up with something. And you'll have the link to that as well the, for the on the podcast. Right. Okay, so if you're listening to us through our YouTube channel, we'd love for you to subscribe. I try to keep all the notifications to a minimum so we're not bugging you all the time. Thank you for joining us. Yep. Hope you all have a great week. Yeah. And, and join it, us next week for historicism. Right. Any episode ideas, um just leave us a comment. We love to hear from you and John answers all his comments well most of them <laughs> you put- we've had a critic recently that i've just been overwhelmed oh, wow. by and I, just, I can't answer everything he's been sending our way yeah but i have it on your schedule to answer like um, once a day yeah answer comments <laughs> yes anyway so if you also if you want to buy us a cup of coffee you can use it the link in the description for that too and we'll see you all next week and thank you for listening to us i am a christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass, and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening, and remember, You can have your religious cake and eat it, too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.